Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Center for Baptist Renewal podcast. My name is Winston Hopman. I'm on the board of directors here at CBR. And I am joined today by Luke Stamps, who, despite his terrible taste in baseball teams, has great taste in coffee, music, and most importantly, theology. Um, so if you're new to us, uh, CBR is a group of Orthodox Evangelical Baptists committed to retrieving the great tradition uh, for the renewal of Baptist faith and practice. And if you enjoy what you hear today, we invite you to check it out on our website at centerforbaptistrenewal.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at, at Baptist Renewal and Facebook at facebook.com slash Baptist Renewal. Also, don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends. Uh, so today we're on the fourth episode in our teaching, our, our theology classics reading challenge, and we're covering Augustine and one of his lesser known works, uh, the Enchiridion, or as it's also known, the Handbook on Faith, Hope, and Love. And so Luke, uh, before we jump into that particular book, um, could you just, I mean, as perhaps unnecessary as this is, just give us an introduction to Augustine. Who is he? Why is he so important? Why did he make our uh, top you know, list of theology uh, works? So. Yeah, so are you a Rangers fan? Let's get this out of the way first. No, I'm actually not. I'm okay. actually not. Uh, I live here in Dallas, but I'm an Atlanta Braves fan. Uh, mm -hmm. My family moved back from the U.S. Uh, I could catch a Braves game every evening on TBS. So there you go. Um, yeah. yeah, I grew up around Braves fans. Uh, ne the next state over in Alabama, and I never, I, I, I hated all of the jo other Georgia teams. So it never made sense to me that I would like like a team just because it was close by. Nice. So anyway, yeah, I'm a Dodgers fan since '88. Oral Hershiser. My parents uh, bought me the 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 biography, the autobiography out of the blue, uh, because he was a Christian, right? Nice. So that's where my nice. my Dodgers fandom comes from. And then of course we lived out there for a while. So anyway, very nothing. cool. It's a good time to be a Dodgers fan. So. It is. It yeah. really is. Uh, we're gonna repeat. I, I tell my students all the time. They're all Braves fans. So <laughs> anyway, so yeah, Saint Augustine. Um, I don't think it's an overstatement to suggest that uh, Saint Augustine is the most important figure in church history after the apostles, uh, at least in, in, in Western Christianity. Um, you know, he, he enjoys a, a bit more tenuous relationship with the Eastern tradition, Eastern Orthodoxy, um, because of his teaching on predestination and so on. But, but certainly in the West, um, Augustine is, is, uh, is, is monumental in significance for both Roman Catholics and for Protestantism. I think it was B.B. Warfield who, who famously said that uh, the Reformation could be seen as uh, Augustine's doctrine of, of grace triumphing over his doctrine of the church. Um, and that may be a little bit of an overstatement, but not much, right? In the, at least in the sense that both uh, of the Western traditions, both Catholicism and Protestantism, are drawing deeply on the well of St. Augustine. Um, and so there's just so many ways that he... Uh, is a watershed moment uh, in the history of, of Western Christianity. Um, you know, the, his, his story is well known. He documents it himself in uh, the Confessions, probably his most well-known work. Um, many people consider it the first autobiography ever written, um, yeah. given the kind of intimate details that he, he tells us throughout his life, um, which kind of tells his journey from... Um, I mean, I kind of tell this in several uh, uh, stages, almost like acts of a drama, uh, from the lust of youth, right, through uh, his fascination with Manichaeism uh, in his 20s, uh, to coming under the sway of Neoplatonism um, around the age of 30, uh, and part of that coming under the sway of, of St. Ambrose of Milan, who was yeah. a Christian Neoplatonist. Particularly uh, who, his uh, scriptural exegesis in his sermon. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Right. So earlier in, in Augustine's life, his, his first confrontation with uh, the scriptures um, was from a bad Latin translation, basically. Uh, and, it, and the Bible seemed inferior to him, inferior to the, the works of, of classical literature like Cicero. Um, and so he just sort of dismissed uh, the Bible as kind of just the quaint faith of his mother, Monica, who, who figures prominently uh, in, in, um, in the Confessions. 
but it's really with Ambrose that he has like a, an example of someone who uh, is uh, intellectually serious, engaged in the philosophies of the day, um, but also, you know, deeply um, committed to the scriptures and to a particular interpretation of the scriptures in light of Christ. Um, so anyway, then after his conversion, um, he becomes a priest and then the Bishop of Hippo. Um, and his writings, of course, stand the test of time as, as really important. Um, again, significant for the, the medieval church and into the Reformation as well. Uh, this one is a is little less well known, right? Um, the Enchiridion, which we can talk about like why we selected this one in a, in a second. But the, the other ones, just to just sort of familiarize people with some of the books that they really should read from St. Augustine. Let me first just ask you, Winston, do you have a favorite? Uh, what's your favorite, Augustine? What's your go-to? Probably on Christian doctrine, okay. just because so much of my study has been early Christian exegesis. Um, I mean, I, I, I almost want to say that because I don't want to say confessions, because I feel like everybody says confessions. But, you know, I read that when I was much younger, it had a profound influence on me. I know it consistently ranks as like one of the most formative books for um, Christian theologians, Christian thinkers. Um, so, I mean, it's probably that, but if I'm going to go with something other than confessions, it's uh, on Christian doctrine. Right. Yeah. I mean, if, if you, if you want to go like one place, right. I mean, I think the the only, if you, it's the only Augustine book you read, then you have to read the confessions. I mean, I think yeah. that really is. If, if anything outside of the Bible deserves the title of a Christian classic that every Christian should read, I think that's 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 on a very short list, right? Yeah. A book yeah. that one say is a kind of must read in the history of Christian thought. Um, and then the other one you mentioned on Christian doctrine, um, I think it also would be very helpful, especially for ministers of the gospel, right? Uh, which I take it probably many of the people that we that are our listeners are involved in ministry of some kind or another. Um, and I just think that's a really helpful book for learning to, to first teach yourself. I mean, that's the, what how Augustine sort of starts it. Like, this is how you teach yourself. In other words, how to interpret the Bible. And then later, sort of how you teach to others. Uh, so it's kind of like a master class, uh, in a sense, of, of, of exegesis and also preaching, right? The right. stuff at the end on, on preaching, um, you know, drawing on, on classic rhetoricians like Cicero, the goal, you know, uh, is is to to teach um, and to inspire, to move, right, or to delight, to teach, to delight, and to move, right. This this idea of of not that the rhetoric of the preacher is the most important thing. Augustine would say, no, it's the truth that we preach that's the most yeah. important. Thing. But if it is the truth, we want to do justice to it at least by doing the best that we can with the gifts that we have to to deliver that message in an effective way. So anyway, that's just a really how about yours? Uh, which is your favorite? Yeah. Um, I mean, I would probably say uh, De Trinitate uh, okay. on the Trinity. Um, you know, just just um, obviously just a classic treatment of the doctrine. Um, it's most well known probably for the um, the so-called psychological analogies that he uh -huh. gives um, for the Trinity in terms of the human sort of human psyche mind, knowledge, will, that sort of thing as kind of a, a, a clue uh, into the, the nature of the Trinity. Um, but actually, most of the book is dedicated to just exegesis, just how, how do we arrive at the doctrine of the Trinity from the scriptures, from what's happening in the Old Testament with these various theophanies, angelophanies that are taking place in the Old Testament, how those are distinct from the mission of the Son and the mission of the Spirit. And then how the missions of the Son and Spirit disclose who God really is, um, you know, as as one singular subject. And yet there are these three distinct uh, persons uh, who have these eternal relations to each other. So just kind of standard fair, you know, uh, Trinity. But obviously, Augustine is, is influential in distilling that yeah. in the fifth century, harvesting, you know, the best of, of the, the fourth century development of the doctrine for a latin speaking context so yeah that that book i think is really worth um worth your time yeah you know you, i read yeah go ahead i was just gonna say you, you mentioned the you know what the book is known for and i think that's true of a lot of its works and maybe it's true of every major theologian like there's certain big ideas and there's a reason why 
those big ideas are known. I mean, they, they're, they're so influential, but there's so much gold, like, you know, to be mined beyond or behind those ideas. And, and, and I feel like you, know, in, you take any of his works, um, even the stuff that they're not known as much for uh, is great. Yeah. And often it, you might be surprised by th those big ideas might shape what you think the book is going to be like. And then you get into it and you find that it's, you know, quite different in places than what you expected. I mean, on Christian doctrine, just how practical it gets and yet maintaining that, that deeply theological, you know, richness to it as well um, is rare when you think about many preaching books today. Right. Uh, and it's not something you might expect when you jump into that, you know, a guy yeah. talking about language and the principles of rhetoric and all of this. So. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's always worth just reading, uh, reading this stuff for yourself, right? I mean, I think yeah. we tend to, well, I need help. I need, you know, I need to watch podcasts like this, or I need to read a book about this. I mean, in some sense, just get started, you know, yeah. like just read these guys, and especially like uh, people like Augustine, who, you know, who most of his work, certainly his major works are available in English, readily available, you know, some of the older translations are in the public domain so that people can read them for free. You know, why would you not avail yourself of that kind of uh, opportunity to read these, you know, yeah. logical masters? Um, you don't, you don't need like special training to do that. And they're actually much more accessible than you realize once you get into them. It, you know, that gets us to the book that we're looking at, uh, the Enchiridion. It's, it's not one of his more widely known books. I mean, it's, it's, it's well known, but it doesn't rank anywhere close to City of God or Confessions. Um, so, so why this book? Um, it, you, you were the most formative like influence in terms of determining what our theology reading challenge was going to look like. Um, in fact, I think you might have single-handedly picked those um, and, and gotten our feedback. Uh, but so why, why were you drawn to this? Why not on Christian doctrine or confessions? City yeah. of God's too big, so that's obvious, but. Right. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess we could have done selections of some of those other books. We, we do that with some other, you know, future reading challenges um, or future, you know, books on the reading challenge, like, you know, Thomas's Summa. We're not going to read all of that, right? yeah. <laughs> but we have a book that we've suggested that's, that are selections from it. We could have done selections from the City of God or selections from De Trinitate or whatever, but I, I thought it would be helpful to pick a shorter book that someone could read, right, in a month. I mean, that was part of the, the consideration for the reading challenge was was picking um you know sort of the classic authors you know and, and classic texts certainly as well but i was thinking in terms of classic authors uh in the history of christian theology and then something that is manageable within a month yeah. um that's part of it it was just sort of the length relative length of it but i mean on well, christian I, teaching could have just could have done done just as easily i suppose yeah but um the Enchiridion. Uh, which is just just means a, a handbook. There are other books that are that that have been published under that title, the Enchiridion. But it, it's basically a, a handbook, as, he, as Augustine calls it, a handbook on faith, hope, and love. It's kind of a nice summary of of his of his theology, really. I mean, you get a lot of there's a lot there's um, sort of a lot of bang for your buck in this one little book, right? Yeah. Because you get um, the the major contours of his theology especially as he confronted various heresies throughout his career. Um, for example, like the Pelagian heresy that, that taught that we could sort of save ourselves by our own good works. Uh, and so there's, you know, you see, he's not naming things necessarily by, uh, by name, you know, he's not sort of singling out heresies by name per se in every point, but sort of, if you're familiar with his career, you can see these things lurking in the background, right? Yeah. Um, and so it's a nice, it's a nice little summary of, of really the whole of his theology as he works his way through primarily just working through the Apostles Creed. Um, and so, you know, I think that it's just, it's a, it's a, a helpful entry point. And, and it's written later in his life. It's one of his yeah. last works. And, uh, and going back to what you said about, you know, the, the length, wanting something small, the, the, the name, it's like you said, the Enchiridion is, is basically translated handbook. And, but he also mentions in the text itself that, you know, Lawrence, who had requested this work, wanted something that he could basically just take with him wherever he went and right. could, um, I don't think it says read it in one sitting, but you can read this in one sitting. And it's, so it's a distalization, like a crystallization of, of his 
the theology hashed out in, a, in the other major works. So, right. Yeah, great yeah. entry point. Yeah, that's right. I love this line early in the book where he's actually talking about this idea uh, of wanting like a book in the hand, you know, like that you could carry with you, not like like a multi volume that would have to go on the shelf at home, but like something that you could have in a single codex that you could take around with you in your hand. But he he tells him at one one point early in the book that it's I'm paraphrasing here, but it's basically better better than a book in the hand is a fire in the heart. You know, if you want if you really want to know how how to to refute the heresies and to know the truth of the faith, um, better than having a, a little book in the hand is having a great fire kindled in the heart. Mm. That's that good was, stuff. Yeah. Very nice. So so you alluded to this, the, the book is structured around the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and love. Um, can you talk a little bit about like, why, why is it structured that way and how that relates to, uh, as, we're, as you, any of our readers will see, you know, the creed and the Lord's prayer and so on. Why is it struck? Why do you think he structures it this way? Yeah. I mean, it seems to be pretty significant in the history of, of Christian thought on this, that we see these three, right? This, this comes straight out of first Corinthians 13, right? So these three remain, right? Faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love, right? Um, we've all been to weddings, right? So we've heard, we've heard um, uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Um, but that, so those, those um, as you mentioned, have been referred to as the theological virtues, uh, along with the four classical virtues or the so-called cardinal virtues. Uh, these are the three Christian virtues, the three, the, the three theological virtues that give, in a sense, give shape to the classical virtues of wisdom, justice, temperance, and um, what am I missing? Wisdom and justice. Courage. Temperance. Right. Fortitude. So the, the, the four classical virtues are given form and shape by the Christian virtues um, of faith, hope, and love. And so this has become then um, a, a kind of standard way of, of catechizing people into the, into the Christian faith um, is teaching um, what, as, he, as Augustine puts it, how is it that we are to worship God in a way that pleases him? Well, there, there's a threefold manner through faith, through hope, through love. Uh, and it's interesting that what we see here um, with Augustine is a kind of correspondence of the Apostles' Creed, the, or the, the, the creed to faith, right? The creed tells us what we are to believe. Uh, and then in Augustine's terms, it's the Lord's Prayer that teaches us what we are to hope for. And, and also how we are to love. So these three are sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, co-implicated, right? Faith, hope, and love uh, kind of co-inhering um, woven together. Now, the way this gets developed later um, in, in Christian catechesis um, is, is also by, by speaking about the Ten Commandments um, as giving shape to Christian love. So again, faith with the, the, the creed, uh, hope with the prayer, the Lord's Prayer, and then the Ten Commandments, uh, giving shape to, to Christian love, that that way of of, of catechesis or, or passing on on the Christian faith, we also see in Reformation and post Reformation yeah. era documents, confessional documents that we would be familiar with. Yeah, so we'll, like, we'll see that with Luther's larger catechism, which yeah. we have on the list as well. So that's right. So Luther's large catechism, um, the Westminster shorter catechism, uh, also um, frames. Christian catechesis in this way. Now, there's also a fourth, and we'll talk about this when we come to Luther, that, but there's kind of a fourth leg of, of, um, of Christian catechesis that it, it is, it is here in Augustine, it's just sort of interspersed, and that is the sacraments or the church. But that kind of fourfold way of teaching the faith, right? The creed, the prayer, the commandments, and the sacraments. Boy, I think that's really still useful, right? I mean, I think that's, that's kind of the kind of thing that we need to be doing in our own homes, right, as we teach the faith to our children, and in the church, as we think about things like Sunday school or, or other forms of discipleship, but that really is what it means to pass on the faith. We're not just, uh, you know, we're not just saying, hey, here's the Bible, have at it, but like, yeah. here's some touch points for us to be able to understand what's in the Bible, and how do we synthesize that, and then live it out, like, not just in terms of, like, how do we know our worldview, and how to defend it against others, but like, how do you pray, and how do you live as a Christian, uh, in terms of obeying God's commandments, and how do you 
uh, draw on the, 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 the means of grace and the sacraments through the church. Anyway, yeah. I just think that's, it, that still has abiding usefulness for Christian discipleship today. Don't you think? Yeah, I think so. I think the, you know, the incorporation of all three, faith, hope, and love, emphasizes in my mind the fact that catechesis isn't just an information dump. Mm. I, I, we're going to see, I mean, Augustine is focused on that first virtue, faith, and articulating what is to be believed since ho hope, hoping and loving correctly depends so much on being able to speak truthfully about God in the world. Um, but at the same time, um, he also, you know, lets you know that if, if all you walk away with are, are these doctrines to be believed, and you don't, and that doesn't find expression and hope and love in a life that's formed, um, uh, then, you know, it's really the kind of knowledge that the demons have, as, as James mm. will say, um, mm. and, and that's going to not help them out on the day of judgment. And so catechesis has to be more than just this information. It's, it's about a process of form formation, shaping people's affections, shaping their lives. And, you know, Augustine's answering the the, the request from uh, the, the man who has asked him to write this is, you know, basically the question of how do you live like a Christian? How, what does it mean to worship God? And, and this is the question that he's answering. Um, and that, that answer involves all of our lives, not merely our, uh, what, we, what we're thinking in our heads, but um, uh, every, uh, our deepest affections. And so, incorporating all three based on that scriptural precedent that you mentioned, 1 Corinthians 13. I'm also thinking of 1 Thessalonians 1, where Paul describes the work of the Spirit in that church uh, as a work of faith, a labor of lo love, and a steadfastness of hope, mm -hmm. and, you know, various other places in the New Testament that combine this triad. You know, it, it, it really is emphasizing that point that um, this is about all of you, um, and those things were really way more integrated for the fathers than they are for us. Like, I mean, I think I think we today would say would I mean that, there's nothing un, there's nothing particularly controversial about about what you just said. Yeah. But I think for us today, it's sort of like step one, step two. They're almost like discrete. Mm. Yeah. They're, they're discrete things. So like what's really and, and really what we emphasize um, in, in in our circles, I think, of sort of you know theologically minded evangelicalism, right? People who, who really take seriously the importance of doctrine. I think we think, well, what really matters is like getting your doctrine right. Like, and, and knowing how to refute false doctrine, knowing how to refute, you know, false worldviews, um, knowing ideas like, you know, that that's what we really kind of focus on that. Um, sometimes maybe out of like reaction to an overly experiential you know, view of the Christian life. We think, well, no, what really matters is truth, getting your doctrine right. And so we, we end up, even in academic theology, we, end, you know, some of our best theologians end up just doing polemics all the time. It's always like, what are we fighting against? You know, what's the next thing to fight against, you know? Um, and I just think that then we sort of say, well, we sort of give, you know, kind of lip service. Yeah, of course, then we also need to live it out, right? And that's really what's important. You know, we're trying to defending the faith for the sake of that. But it's still sort of like a separate conversation, you know, yeah. Yeah. and and that just wasn't true for the fathers. Like it, it's interesting that, that what they really took seriously what Jesus said when he said the pure in heart will see God. Mm -hmm. That what's most important for in, in in fitting you for the task of theology is not a degree, it's not a particular skill, it's not having read a certain list of books, but what really fits you to be a theologian is purity. And I just think we don't think in those terms, right? We don't, we just don't, we don't think that there's like an epistemological necessity for purity that like yeah. you, you stopped in your ability to understand God. If you're not living in a way that pleases God, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Whereas these things were just integrated. It wasn't like a step one and step two discrete, uh, kind of sort of isolated things in the Christian life. Yeah. And, and if I remember correctly, the way Augustine relates this elsewhere is that there's this dialogical relationship between knowledge and love such that not only do you have to know something in order to love it appropriately, but you also have to love it in order to know it rightly. 
Right. Um, and uh, and and I mean that 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 explains as you've said why um, you know piety um, uh, is so important to them in terms of arriving at an accurate interpretation of scripture. Um, I just imagine, could you imagine saying that at SBL that uh, uh, <laughs> in order to to arrive at a proper interpretation of what this passage actually means, you need to confess Christ as Lord and be uh, indwelt by his Holy Spirit, you know, no, or, that's or where even, you get to the radical nature of that relationship. Right. Or, or even ECS, right? I mean, oh, the, for that's the, true, yeah. I'm not familiar, like the SBL is the Society of Biblical Literature, it's sort of the secular uh, biblical scholars guild. ETS, the Evangelical Theological Society, which is ostensibly Christian, and I'm not saying it's not, I mean, of course it is, but I'm just saying so often we, we still see that same bifurcation, that kind of that sort of same uh, siloing of like, you know, you have scholarship um, and then you have spirituality, right? Yeah. And we just think it's sort of, it's almost like uncouth to try to integrate those things, even in a Christian society, right? We, we still think, well, that's, you know, leave that for the Sunday school, right? Well, we're going to do the real scholarship now. Uh, yeah. And as if, as if there's this bifurcation between the two. So I don't know. It, yeah. It's just, it's just kind of jarring when you read this in the church fathers. I think we, you know, those of you, those of you who read the, uh, the, the theological orations of Gregory, uh, the same thing comes through there, right? He says, not everyone is even fit to study theology, but yeah. those who, those who are, are making progress in meditation and in purity, those are the ones who are who are fitted for theology. Hmm. That'll drive you to prayer as a theologian. Hmm. That's right. Sure. God help us, right? I mean, oh, I'm not, yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I need God's help, like to even begin this thing, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so faith, hope, and love rise and fall together. Um, but you know, when you get into the actual text, and I'm I'm thinking about the uh, the page numberings as as opposed to the the sections. Um, you know, mine begins on. Faith begins on page 39, runs up until about like page 135, 134. And then you have, and, and that's all faith. And then you have uh, two and a half pages on hope and about four pages, four and a half pages on love. How do you explain that? So, so is, on the one hand, is this, is this uh, Augustine being a good Baptist preacher and front loading the first of his three points and now he's just got to rush at the end because he's got to fit this into a handbook or is there is there a reason a rationale for spending so much time on uh faith yeah yeah i mean it, it it is kind of odd if you just look at it in terms of those three and just how imbalanced they are but when you read uh his explanation of the distinctions between faith and hope uh, and how they relate to love early on in the book there's a sense in which he kind of downplays faith, right? I mean, he, he says hope is in some ways superior to faith because faith can be, uh, you could, the sort of faith could have as its object an evil person, right? You could believe in, in a wicked person or, or you could believe something that's untrue or whatever. Whereas, whereas hope is kind of faith directed at a good object, you know? Yeah. And then of course, love is the, the, the supreme uh, virtue. Um, and so, you know, he, he, it's not that he thinks that faith is more important, but it does seem, he does seem to think that faith is, is foundational for the other two, right? Yeah. It, it has a, a kind of priority in that sense that, that the faith, which is really what he has in mind, um, the Christian faith, as it's explained in the, in the creed, is, is what is foundational for, for the other two theological virtues. What, yeah. what do you think? Why do you think? Yeah, he spent yeah tell me, tell me what you think. I, Part of me thinks, you know, what he's articulating in the section on faith is really the object of all three. Hmm. Um, so these are things that we ought to believe, um, but these are also the things that we are to long for and the things that we are to love. You know, his articulation of the triune God and the manifestation of his plan of salvation uh, for his people. Um, so part of me thinks, even though that's included under the section of faith, it's not really uh, in any way, uh, overshadowing the importance of the two virtues, because what you get, what he, what he's giving you here is the object that is to be believed, but also the object that is to be at the same time hoped for and loved in, if that belief is going to be true faith. So, yeah, 
Yeah. Obviously, there's part of the, the creed itself that is oriented toward the future, right? I mean, so there's yeah. the, the, the articles on uh, the return of Christ, to judge the quick and the dead, and also the, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting, you know, so the, the creed itself, uh, the faith itself is, has with, embedded within it this forward-looking hope. And as you point out also, just with God as the object, right, the triune God as the object of the creed, uh, well, God is the primary object of our love and the ultimate source of our happiness. Um, and so, yeah, you're right. It's all three are sort of interwoven, even as he, he spends most of his time expositing the creed. Yeah, yeah. So, so we've mentioned the, the creedal structure, uh, especially that first section. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about you know, why he does that? And maybe also a few places to draw our attention to, maybe some places that we could camp out at and some important sections that would be worth highlighting. Yeah. So yeah, the creeds um, have, have been used, you know, well, way before they were even written down, right? The, 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 what, what St. Irenaeus calls the, the rule of truth or what we sometimes call the rule of faith uh, as a kind of summary statement of, of the Christian, of Christian doctrine in terms of faith, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, that, that way of, of synthesizing the main message of the Bible goes all the way back to the early second century and then in, into the third century, those things start to be written down uh, in terms of like the old Roman creed, which is underneath the Apostles Creed, um, which appears to be the structure that he's using here. And then the, the Nicene Creed as well has that threefold structure, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so this has been, this goes way back, way before Augustine, uh, as a way of, of teaching the faith to baptismal candidates. That's what that's what took place uh, in, in early Christian catechesis was people preparing for baptism, they would undergo this, this, um, this kind of teaching through, through the creed. And so this, this, he's not really inventing something here uh, to do this, but this is kind of standard Christian catechesis through, through, um, through the Apostles' Creed. And, and obviously there's more here than we can talk about in this one video. Uh, and, and really the goal is, is, for re is reading this on your own and, and sort of discovering for yourself, uh, what's there? Uh, I mean, I do think it's it's helpful to keep in mind some of the, again, some of the heretical landmines in the background, things that don't necessarily. He's not necessarily fronting them and saying, "Hey, look, uh, here are the heresies to avoid." Per se, and sometimes he will, but um, you know, so things on like the first article on the on God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Um, you know, lurking in the background here are all of the various Gnostic heresies that the church confronted over the first several centuries. Gnosticism being that idea that the material world is inferior or evil, uh, and it's the spiritual realm that's really the good. Um, and, and so this emphasis on the goodness of the material world that God has made and so on. That, so that's, that, that's some stuff that is, is it's going on in the background to be aware of. Um, and then also as he moves into the, the second article on, on redemption through Christ, um, also in the background here is the Pelagian heresy, which is one that, you know, the controversy that, that Augustine was especially instrumental in answering um, Pelagianism, uh, which was named after uh, a British monk named Pelagius. Again, as I said earlier, he taught basically that we're born morally neutral and, and can kind of choose of our own free will uh, what is right. And we only sin by imitating other, others and we can decide of our own free will to do what is right apart from divine grace. And so all of the emphasis that we read here on, uh, on divine grace and salvation, that even our faith is a gift from God, um, all of that stuff has, I think, the Pelagian controversy in its background. Um, and then, of course, there's all kinds of Trinitarian and, and Christological heresies in the background here as well. Um, and so I thought it might be helpful to, to look at one particular article, um, if, you, if, if you have it uh, handy. Um, in chapter, this is chapter 35. On, uh, the, the title here says, Jesus Christ being the only son of God is at the same time man. I mean, this is the stuff that I really, you know, perk up whenever I read because the incarnation is kind of the doctrine that I've focused most of my own attention on. Um, 
but anyway, I just, I just wanted to read through this and kind of highlight a few things, if that's cool. Yeah. Um, just so you can kind of see what's going on um, again and, and so, so some of the things that he's responding to. So anyway, he says, wherefore Christ Jesus, the son of God, is both God and man, God before all worlds, man in our world, God because the word of God, for, quote, the word was God, that's from John 1, and man because in his one person the word was joined with a body and a rational soul. So already there, that's, that's language that uh, is picked up in the, the, the definition of Chalcedon from 451, um, but it's in opposition to the heresy of Apollinarianism, right? So if you're, if those of our, our listeners who may be familiar with this, uh, Apollinarianism was the view that basically said that, that the son of God sort of took the place of the soul in the man, Jesus, yeah. so that all that the son assumed in the incarnation was a body. And it's the person of the son who is kind of replacing the place where the soul would ordinarily be in a normal human, right? Yeah. Um, and the church is almost something of a shell. In yeah, that case. yeah, that's right. I had a church history professor in seminary who described this as the God in a bod heresy. <laughs> I always remembered it. God in a bod. Yes. Um, but that's what Apollinaris thought, right? That, that, that there's this kind of replacement of the human soul by the person of the son. And the church recognized that from the beginning, uh, all the way back to Gregory of Nazianzus uh, in the fourth century as an error, right? That, that if there's some part of our human nature that's not been assumed by the son in the incarnation, then that part of our human nature remains unredeemed. As Gregory put it, the, un the unassumed is unhealed. And so this emphasis on a body and a rational soul, right? He has a, a soul that's possessed of reason. He has a human mind and a human soul. Um, that is, has Apollinarianism in the background. And so you see here um, uh, Augustine affirming body and a rational soul. He goes on to say, wherefore, so far as he is God, he and the Father are one. So far as he is man, the father is greater than he. And those are both, you know, allusions to John. I and the father are one and the father is greater than I. Those are both statements from John's gospel. Um, but this, this, um, this way of, of reading the biblical material uh, has been referred to as partitive exegesis. Again, some of our readers, um, listeners may be familiar with this term, others may not. But partitive exegesis was this, uh, strategy of, of interpretation in the church fathers by which they sought to discern whether or not a passage was referring to the son of God as such God as God, right? The son of God as God, or whether or not that passage was talking about the son of God in his incarnate mission. Right. And so that's, that's what, what Augustine is doing here as well. This kind of part of the exegesis. Is it talking about the son of God as God, or is it talking about the son of God in his incarnation? Um, so have you read much in that area, Winston, that, that notion of part of exegesis? Yeah, uh, I mean, to an extent. Um, yeah, I mean, this is especially critical when you get to passages like, you know, Proverbs chapter eight. Right. Which seem to, you know, first of all, unlike many modern interpreters, we have to understand that, you know, the early church understood wisdom in Proverbs chapter eight to be uh, a reference ultimately to Christ. Um, right. And so there's some language there that seems to speak, uh, imply that wisdom is created itself. Right. Um, and so what do you do with that language? What, what is it? What is it referring to? This, this, you know, passages like that were used by the Arians to affirm um, the status of the son as a creature. Um, and so the part of the part of exegesis, which, of course, you know, wasn't known by that name at the time. Right. Um, there were a lot of different names and uh, terms used to to refer to what they were doing but uh, that 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 practice was critical i mean in the yeah. formation of a uh, of an orthodox reading of the bible that's right um and it's something that um i mean we give up at our peril uh, yeah. you know in, in my opinion so yeah that's right and a lot of the trinitarian issues that we've seen in in recent years i think this really is the missing piece for a lot of for, for a lot of those misunderstandings, I think, of what's going on with with especially like passages that talk about the submission of the son to the father. 
Uh, if you don't have this reading strategy in place where you can recognize that some things are spoken about the son of, son of God only with reference to his incarnation, only, only with reference to um, his incarnate mission, mm -hmm. uh, then you end up reading, sort of reading things that are tied to the economy of, of redemption back into the imminent life of God. Uh, and the, the early church fathers knew that that was a potential mistake that you could make. And that's why they developed this way of reading. And you see it uh, not just in Augustine, but you see it, you know, back with the Cappadocian fathers as well in the fourth century. You also see it in the fifth century with Cyril of Alexandria. You see it also with Pope Leo the Great um, in, in his tome uh, written to the Council of Chalcedon. So the point is just to say it's kind of all over the place uh, in the early church fathers. This is the way Christians read the Bible, right? That's right. how you could read, it, read the Bible in a way that was coherent. Yeah. Because on the face of it, it's incoherent to say, I and the Father are one. And in the very same gospel, the Father is greater than I. Unless you have recourse to this, well, two natures, right? I mean, that's what, 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 it, what it is. If you, if you believe that Christ has two natures, then the Bible can speak about him in two different ways. And he kind of goes on to spell that out in what follows, especially building on uh, the Philippians 2 uh, passage, which he does, he does as well in De Trinitate. Uh, but he says, for when he, was, for, for when he was the only son of God, not by grace, but by nature, that he might be also full of grace, he became the son of man. And he himself unites both natures in his own identity, and both natures constitute one Christ. So there's, there's only one person against the Nestorian heresy, but he has two natures, right? They're not, they're not merged into some third nature, uh, but they're two distinct natures um, in the one person, the one identity of Jesus. Because, um, as he says, sorry, my son is coming in, so you'll hear his, him in the background here. But um, because, he says, being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be what he was by nature, equal with God. So that's just a reference to, to Philippians 2. But he made himself of no reputation took, and took upon himself the form of a servant, not losing or lessening the form of God. So that uh, forma dei and forma servi um, distinction that we see there in Philippians 2 is, is, how, is where Augustine largely gets this reading strategy. Is mm -hmm. the, the Bible itself talks about Christ as being both in the form of God and in the form of a servant. What's interesting also to me about that passage is that it, is that it excludes a, a contemporary uh, or a modern uh, theory of the atonement known as canonic Christology or the canonic theory. It's based on the, the word here from Philippians 2, uh, the word for, for made himself nothing or emptied himself or made himself of no reputation the way that, that Augustine renders it here. But the canonic theory basically says that in order to become incarnate, God the Son had to give up certain divine attributes in order to sort of live within the constraints of an ordinary human nature. So they couldn't be both omnipresent, everywhere present, and at the same time, you know, in the womb of the Virgin Mary. So yeah. it, it, he has to sort of give up the omni attributes, right, in mm -hmm. order to live within the constraints of, of human nature. But, but Augustine um, says just the opposite here, right? So he says he, he took upon himself the form of a servant, not losing or lessening mm -hmm. the form of God, right? So this is kind of a, a standard formula that you see in the fathers all over the place. Without ceasing to be what he was, he became what he was not. And even for those who are unfamiliar with the term like canonic theology, there is a more popular level, this kind of misunderstanding that in becoming incarnate, the son gives up something, you know, he loses something. And uh, I think one of the most helpful ways of framing this that that I was ever taught was to think of it not in terms of negation you know, or, or deletion, sub subtraction, something being subtracted from him, but as an addition, you know, um, which, you know, has to be fleshed out what that, what that means. Mm -hmm. But um, the, uh, the, his incarnation doesn't jeopardize or diminish his deity. That's right. That's right. He did, he's not transformed into a human, right. but he assumes a human nature. Yeah. I mean, that's another distinction that, that Augustine makes here. It's not that he's changed into a human, um, like a transformer, you know, like or he, is some he, kind of hybrid, you know, yeah. like third, third option as well. Yeah. Neither, right. neither fully God nor fully man. That's right. Uh, so he's not transformed into some, 
some other creature, right? Um, some other entity. But he he remains what he is. But he just he assumes he takes to himself. That's what the word assumes mean. He he takes to himself um, a, a human nature, right? A complete human nature, body and soul. He goes on to say, accordingly, he was both made less and remained equal, being both in one, as has been said. But he was one of these as word and the other as man. As word, he is equal with the father. As man, he is less than the father. So this is a, a, another another kind of technical term that has been used to describe uh, the, the early church fathers on this point is the communication of attributes, the communicatio idiomatum, right? The communication of attributes, that properties of both natures uh, are attributable to the same person, right? Because he is both God and man, the properties of divinity are attributed to him and the properties of humanity are attributed to him. It's not that the properties of divinity are attributable to, hu to humanity, right? It's not that the divine attributes are transferred to the human nature or vice versa, but that both natures are attributable to the same person, the same uh, subject who is God the word. That's why he goes on to say one son of God at the same time, son of man, one son of man at the same time, son of God, not two sons against the Nestorian heresy, right? That's another heresy here. Um, the two persons heresy of Nestorianism not two sons of God, God and man, but one son of God, God without beginning, man with a beginning, our Lord Jesus Christ. So anyway, in that one paragraph in chapter 35, Augustine kind of distills the classical doctrine of the incarnation, right? We see all of the, the elements here, one person, two natures, the communication of attributes, how that helps us to read the Bible in terms of partitive exegesis, uh, he's, he's sort of shielding this orthodox doctrine against Apollinarianism uh, on the one side and Nestorianism on the other. And so there's just a whole bunch of, of theology packed into that one paragraph. Uh, and that's just picking up on one chapter, right? I mean, this, this book is like that, where it, because it's a, sum, it's a sort of summary fashion describing um, the Christian faith, you get these kind of densely packaged distillations of yeah. patristic doctrine that's why i think it's such a valuable resource it should come with like a from concentrate label, label yeah. on there, something like that yeah. so so with the time we have left uh one of the passages that we wanted to talk about was in the section on love the the four stages of humanity and yeah. Uh, you know, kind of synthesizing here with what he says elsewhere, I'm thinking particularly on, on Christian doctrine of the Christian life as a journey of the affections, um, mm. a journey of love. He, he lays out within this chapter of the, or this section of the Enchiridion, these four stages of humanity. So maybe we could talk about those uh, and, and be done. Yeah, so and it sort of mirrors, as he says here, it sort of mirrors the history of redemption, right? Um, that, that we sort of have one stage before the law, um, which after the fall means that we do all kinds of crazy stuff, you know, we're sort of running wild without the law, a stage under the law where the law comes and condemns us, right, and shows us our sin, uh, a, a stage under grace in the, in the gospel by which we are given some power given the power of God to overcome sin, but we still in the flesh struggle with sin. And then the final state of being set free and finally at peace um, a, 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 apart from the, the presence of sin. And it sort of tracks also into uh, the way that Augustine um, elsewhere, you know, talks about um, the kind of freedom that we have uh, in, in these four stages, right? That we have uh, in the beginning, we were free you know, before Adam fell, he was free to sin or not sin. After the after the fall, he's not free not to sin. I mean, there are Latin terms underneath these, but I'm just going to render it in English. That we're not free not to sin. Everything we do is sin, right? Apart from grace. And then in Christ, we are now once again set free not to sin by the power of the Holy Spirit. But in the final state, uh, the glorified saints in heaven are rendered not able to sin, which is the highest freedom for yeah. for saints. So the highest freedom is not this kind of deliberation between choices, but the highest freedom is to be set free from even the possibility of sin, to be so transfigured and transformed 
that we become like God in that sense, unable to sin. And so, I mean, that, that, that also just shows you that Augustine is carefully attending not only to what we would call systematic theology, right, but also to biblical theology as well, to the history of redemption as, it's un, as it unfolds across the canon of scripture. Right. And, and I mean, the, the reason why that's so important to the topic of love is that you, you take the first two stages, so pre, pre-law and then under law. Um, with the law, I mean, the law is a good thing. He's not going to ever attribute you know, you know, evil to the law or something like that. But with the law comes now a, a knowledge of sin. We, we sin knowingly, which is even more egregious than sinning perhaps in ignorance in some kind of a pre-law condition. Um, and that's because the law cannot give the kind of love that's necessary to walk in the freedom that God intends for us. And so it's only at stage three with the gift of the spirit um, that you begin to then, you know, have us opened up once again to the, that, that freedom um, to not be able to, to, to be able not to sin. Mm -hmm. um, and then ultimately the eternal peace and rest. And, and, and it's interesting. He describes it in that way. Um, you know, for him, it's, it's, it's stages of conflict mm -hmm. um, with uh, uh with the third stage um, uh, under grace, you still have the conflict between spirit and the flesh. Um, and then he describes that the, 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 the final state as full and perfect peace is the English translation mm. that I have. Um, a humanity that's whole and undivided within itself, both at the individual level and then like you said, humanity as a whole living peaceably together. Uh, with one another in the kingdom of God. So, mm, that's rich. Yeah. And that, that of course, you know, reflects what he says elsewhere in on Christian doctrine. The end of every commandment is love. That's the ultimate destiny, the ultimate um, purpose. Mm. Um, any other thoughts, final thoughts before we wrap up on this book? Any recommendations to, to readers? We, we mentioned beforehand, there's a, there's a few fun places a few fun sections and yeah, maybe right. some, you know, some stuff that, uh, and you, we may not have the time, but a few places that we, you know, we're, we don't want to just uh, sell ourselves as, you know, Augustine fanboys or patristic fanboys. We read them critically. They're human authors. They get stuff wrong and there's stuff here in Augustine that we're going to disagree with him on uh, both as just contemporary Christians, but also as Baptists. So. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Because I mean, you got infant baptism in here. We don't need to pretend like we didn't see that too, right? Um, <laughs> on this Baptist Catholicity reading list, we have this defense of infant baptism. Um, and then obviously the stuff that Augustine teaches on on on, on sex, um, you know, there's been reams of, of books written on, on that. But um, there, you know, there are things that we're just going to disagree with him on, as you said, and that's fine. We don't, we don't need to pretend like um, the fathers were somehow infallible. Um, but there is all kinds of interesting stuff in here. I mean, there's stuff on the angels, stuff on Satan, there's stuff on the, the nature of the resurrection, on what happens to, to uh, like we were talking about earlier before we got on, like the, what happens with like miscarried babies? How are they going to be resurrected? You know, uh, we believe they are, but not, not in the same, you know, not for the same reasons that, that someone who came to faith as an adult you know, like, so there's just things like that, that you're like, what, what do we believe about that? The same thing is true, you know, on a much broad, broader scale, if you read the city of God, which is a book about literally everything, right? The, the city of God is a book about the Bible. It's about theology, it's about the Roman history. It's about the biblical history. It's about the future state. It's about humans. It's about angels. It's about politics. It's about theology. I mean, it's literally about everything. Yeah. That's why it runs about 1400 pages long. Um, and they're just, there's just so many nuggets, you know, that you, you really can't get unless you just start to dig in to St. Augustine. Yeah. yeah. Well, we hope our readers enjoy it. And, uh, Luke, thank you for joining me on today's podcast and, and to our listeners, if you enjoyed it, please share, uh, please get the word out about Center for Baptist Renewal and our vision for, uh, renewing, uh, contributing our part to, to, to the Spirit's renewal of Baptist churches uh, through retrieval of the great tradition. We'll see you next time.